ladies and gentlemen, it's time! Brought to you by Ringside, the best in boxing, it's the Zapata Brand Boxing Podcast! Introducing first, fighting out of the Zapata Brand Studio in Berwick, Pennsylvania. He is an expert in boxing and bagels, George Zapata! Well, fight fans, we are back. The Zapata Brand Boxing Podcast brought to you by Ringside. Go to ringside.com forward slash podcasts for 40% off selected brands. And my guest, of course, is Percy Crawford of the VIP crew, the new YouTube channel with his partner, Vivek Wallace. Percy Crawford, how are you? A few things working on. I'm working on, man, doing well, doing very well for this uh extended fourth of july break i get from work so i'm i'm extremely happy well you got a lot of things in the fire first let's talk about it right off the bat the vip crew your new youtube channel go over there subscribe and like to the channel give me a little bit about it you and vivek wallace what do you guys got cooking over there yeah man i've been knowing vivek for mm, probably 15 years or so man and uh, another rare good guy in the sport of boxing we've always kind of worked hand in hand but never necessarily worked directly together so um, he came up with the concept, you know, V for Vivek. The I is basically a microphone. And then P for Percy. Uh, I kind of liked it. We ran with it. And uh, it's just kind of getting started, man, getting off the ground. But uh, it's going to be it's going to be big things from it, man. We're going to put up the audios to interviews. We're going to go on live spaces. I'll actually be able to return the favor of giving, uh, you know, this amazing platform you give me and have you come on. And, and I love to hear your story, man, the whole, you know, bagels and boxing and how you got the bagel shop i'd love to get that out there so um definitely man good things coming up now what is you the platform and the concept is it going to be strictly boxing are you doing like a, it seems like you're doing a wide variety i saw a couple articles you wrote there uh in about music and about i saw the boxing one but what is it what are you going to base it on is it just is it going to be a, a life type of uh a life type of platform yeah what it is man is it's going to basically give um viewers or, or subscribers they're going to be a fly on the wall to these interviews um so i'll put the audio up and it will be a wide range of genres man i i actually interviewed a boxer a pastor and geez uh r b singer all in yeah. one day so it, it's going to be a, a plethora of different genres um different little niche uh you know conversations and topics but um it's going to be good, man. I think it's, I, I'm finally combining everything I've done over the years and kind of put it on one uh, platform. And that's good. So there's a little bit for everybody there to go. Again, it's the VIP crew on YouTube, the YouTube channel. You know, you'll do VIP crew backslash YouTube, and you'll find it there. Percy Crawford, Vivek Wallace. Uh, so far, so good. It's going great. I watch it. I've, I Oh, well, it's, you're, it's not a visual yet. Am I correct? It's just um, the interviews themselves. Just the interviews. We haven't done a live space or anything like that yet. That's okay. coming. This is kind of like if we were in a restaurant business, so you'll know about this. This is kind of our soft open. <laughs> but yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. we're looking first week of August uh, is being like the kind of just roll out everything. So it's a process, mm -hmm. as you know, but it's coming along fine, man. And it's, it's going to be big. Well, I know if you, if we just go by your your credentials and Vivek's credentials, this will be this will take off pretty pretty quickly. So you might as well get on board now, like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you then. But let's get in, back a little bit on track with what's going on in the boxing world. But most importantly, what happened in UFC UFC three hundred three last week? A crazy card. Uh, not what let's just say it wasn't the greatest card, but the craziness with. Dan Dan Ige jumping in three hours after a massage to fight, and then of course you had the main event. Your overall, what was your overall opinion on the card? Wasn't UFC three hundred, but wasn't the worst because it showcased uh, Alex Pereira. Um, a prayer, very good. Yeah, great showcase for him. Um, but like you say, probably I wouldn't describe it as a good card, a wild card. Absolutely, I mean from. 
Brian Ortega missing weight and then moving it up a weight class to Brian Ortega being ruled out and he couldn't fight. And then they literally found the guy who was off a massage table. And I want to say he said he was grocery shopping. And they mm-hmm. called him on a few hours notice uh, in Dan Egan, and he stepped in and actually got a win. I actually saw Matt Brown, who's a recently retired UFC vet, say um, maybe that's an interesting concept, like, you know, keeping guys ready year round and calling them on short notice for fights. I don't know if I would subscribe to the whole not having a full camp and, mm-hmm. you know, studying opponents thing. But, uh, hey, man, it worked out for him. I thought Alex Pereira did Alex Pereira type things. I mean, he can punch. Obviously, at that weight class, he can punch like hell. Um, he was fighting Jerry uh, Prochowska. Pr- I'm sorry, I can always butcher his name. Prochowska. Yeah, Jerry. <laughs> who's, uh, yeah, Jerry, who's, um, they were familiar with each other. They had a good fight the first time. Um, I actually, and this is something minute that I caught, but I look at things like this. I actually thought Jerry should have sat down between rounds because he got dropped literally with seconds left after the first yeah. round. Stood up, kind of bounced around a little bit. And honestly, when he came out for the second round, he kind of looked like a zombie. I don't know if he got his legs back under him. He gets hit mm-hmm. with the head kick, and it all goes downhill from there. Um, I didn't like Yuri's fight at UFC 300. I thought he took a lot of damage to score that knockout. So I knew Alex Pereira would be very dangerous. And uh, it, he ended up being a little too dangerous for him. He put him out. A, a couple things. Uh, one on the weight cut, one on Yuri coming back so fast. The weight cut. Uh, Brian Ortega, this he's missed weight a few times now. Um, what what do you when you're saying it might be a new th- thing to subscribe to, whereas you just fight your weight? This weight cutting issue is becoming more and more prevalent. For you know, he was all, all on his way up. He was on his way up. He was going up. They call him and say, "No, I can make the weight." Not only does I'm gonna say that the weight cut may have had something to do with him getting 103 fever the next the next day. Of course. Um, where, where do you stand on that? Do you think there should be like, okay, if you're like, do it in wrestling a lot in high school wrestling, your weight is this, you got to be here. Because this is a couple times, and they, uh, this putting that kind of money, because already Connor dropped out, they put a lot of money into the show. Now they have to come back with Ortega going in, in, in the co main event. Now that drops out. And if I'm buying a ticket, I'm selling for, you know, although if I didn't know the circumstances behind it, I would have said, what the hell am I getting? But it was a weird, it was an interesting circumstance. What do you feel about the weight cutting? So they deem same day weigh-ins too dangerous in boxing. So I don't see us going back to that. But I I do think something has to be done. I mean, I, I think he missed weight by six pounds. It, it's not even the guys that are close, you know, 0.8 pounds or a pound here or there. And this was, you know, I, I don't know, man. Co-main event status. I really don't know what the fix is. Obviously, you want guys to fight closer to their natural weight. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, George, I don't understand how fighters feel they have an advantage to suck down like that, blow up to some astronomical number to have a weight advantage. It it has to slow you down. Obviously, it's doing a number on your kidneys and things like that. I I don't know. I don't get that mentality. I've, I've seen it help and hurt. I've seen guys who come in big like that look great. I've seen guys who come in big like that look terrible. Um, James Tony, James Tony comes to mind when he blew up. He, he would get down, but then when he blew up, he looked. He he lost to Dave Tiberi. He got the decision, but he lost to Dave Tiberi because he blew up to almost two hundred pounds, cuts weight, and he looked terrible. Looked horrible. I, I was thinking, you know, rest his soul, Anthony Rumble Johnson when he blew up. Yeah. He, 25 pounds against Vitor Belfort, and it just didn't go well for him. Um, I could see it being an advantage. I could see it being a disadvantage. But the fact of the matter is, like you said, it's starting to become a thing now where I, I want to say a UFC ago, they say they had three or four people had to come back to the scale twice. That, that's crazy to me. And you, you're not going to always get Dan Egan lucky. You're not going to always just be able to replace a fight like that. So imagine you lose that fight on a card that people are already a little bit down about because of the kind of situation. I, I don't know. It's something they got to get a grasp on because um, not only it does it sucks for the fans, it's dangerous. Yeah, I, I just got done sparring a little while ago, and I feel that when I have a little bit of something in my stomach, a little bit of something I feel, I feel better. I feel mm-hmm. better. When I'm, when I'm not – when I'm hungry and I'm cutting weight and doing whatever, and, and I haven't had to cut weight in a long time – um, cause I just fight it. What I fight at, that's it. Um, 
I feel it hurts me. I feel like my strength goes down. I'm tired faster. I think they should really, I think the, the way that, and if I, I, I forget the fighter who did it, it may have been a Frankie Edgar who just said, this is the way that I fight at. That's what it is. I'm not cutting. I'm not gaining. This is where I fight. And he always did well, maybe a, a pound here or two, but he felt, he, and he looked good. He looked strong. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of UFC guys that say when they get to the venue, they they like to have between 10 and 12 pounds to cut or else they're just sitting in their hotel room. Kind of understand that logic. That's still, to me, I mean, if you get to the venue on a Wednesday or Thursday, it's not giving you a whole bunch of time. I think the problem is a lot of these guys, and you hear it, I have it down to a science. That's what they all say. I have it down to a science. Well, you have it down to a science until you don't. And I'm sure Ortega, like you say, who's missed weight a few times, I'm sure he feels he had it down to the science until he didn't. And then five pounds turned into wiping them off the card because I'm sure there was some kind of residual effects to the weight cut, which led to the fever, which led to the, you know, him being stripped off the card. So um, not a good problem. It's very dangerous to cut that kind of weight. It's very dangerous to cut that kind of weight and blow back up like that in 24 hours. So it's something they got to get a grasp of and get a hold of it because, um, I don't see same day weigh ins coming back as an option. No, I don't think that'll come back. That that was too dangerous there because because we can, it's the almost the wrestling the amateur wrestling mentality most of these guys have. They cut their weights with those sauna suits and uh, salt baths and whatever. It's it's a mentality. This is a little different. You're getting your head knocked around a little bit more dangerous. Definitely. definitely. Now let's speaking of weight, uh, Pereira in the main event shows he can handle uh, light heavyweights. You know he shows he can handle the 205 division. The talk is that they want him to move to the heavyweight. Dana White says no. A lot of people say yes. I did see an interview with Pereira after the fight. He is a massive guy. His hands, his hands are huge. I think he can carry the weight. The issue I only have is the guys are coming down from 265 to get down to that weight. He got knocked out by Adesanya. Not saying Adesanya can't punch, but it was... A clean shot. I believe it was round three, if not round four. He got knocked out, so it's later in the fight. Can he handle a heavyweight move? Can he handle the punch also? So the pushback you'll get from the Pereira fans is that he was sucking down too far in 185, and that's why he got knocked out because obviously the you know the fluid you lose around your brain, you just don't your punch resistance is diff different when you're sucking down that low. Mm -hmm. I did see where he rehydrated overnight from 205 to, I think he was like 230.4. 236, I think I thought it was. I thought Something it was crazy. Yep. Not a bad heavyweight weight, but like you said, when you're talking about guys that's coming down from 280 to cut to the limit of 265, different animal. And to me, Alex Pereira is not the fastest guy, so I don't think he can rely on his speed. I think he would rely on calf kicks, um, kind of one-two punches. I don't know if he could trade one-two punches with a guy outweighing him by 30, 40 pounds. And I think a lot of people forget Alex Pereira is 37 years old. He's had a whole kickboxing career already. So, oh, man, I don't know. I think that might be a little bit too much to bite off with his age, um, his lack of wrestling ability. There, there's some yeah. question marks for me if he was going to try to make that move because if I'm a heavyweight, I'm taking him down. If I, if I, you know, the matchup that my brother had said, Curtis Blades would be a tough fight for him because he's a good wrestler, bigger guy. And, and that's one, not saying that he takes a great punch, but the punches that knocked him out were Derek Lewis and that they can really punch. I don't know if Perrick can punch that hard. He has a punch, but he can't wrestle. He can, he, he has yet to fight a guy who can wrestle. That's going to be his Achilles heel. John Jones, I think, is the great, the, the greatest. Pure fighter and pure MMA fighter I've ever seen. If you put any combat sports together, he 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 comes out on top in my opinion. Um, if they were to fight, wh who would you lean towards and why? John Jones, um, and I would even say quite easily. I just think John can do a little bit of it all. John uses his elbows like jabs. John is kind of underratedly athletic. He's fast when he wants to be fast. He can drag mm -hmm. you into whatever kind of fight he wants to drag you into. And he has underrated wrestling because he hasn't had to use it a whole lot because his length and everything is so long. But when 
Daniel Cormier can't take you down and keep you there. Yeah, yeah, pretty good wrestling, and and vice versa. When you can take Daniel Cormier down, you have pretty good wrestling. Alex Pereira not only doesn't have good wrestling, but he's a very stiff fighter. And I think when you're, I hate the term weight bully, but I'm gonna say it. I think when you're weight bullying guys, it, it's <laughs> a lot easier to be stiff. One, two, power shot, low kick, head kick. I I just think Al. John Jones brings so many things to the table. And I remember talking to Daniel Cormier about John Jones. And he said, you know what, person, his knees hurt. His punches and all that don't really hurt. His knees hurt really bad. But it's just you have to prepare for so much. He throws so much at you with the spinning attacks and, you know, the elbows and all those things. He says, so it's almost impossible. I just think Pereira is a little too basic. To, to be able to deal with all the things that John Jones can bring to the table. If he can continue to make 205, especially at a, I think we'll call 37 at advanced stage in combat sports, make 205 and reign supreme, man. Yeah, I've I've always questioned why people move up so much. I, I love De La Hoya at 130. He moved up, didn't get touched up until he got to 160. But they every single time someone had, they said they always got to move up. He's got to move up. Why not? Why not? Like you said, reign supreme at a, at a weight class that you're the best that you are at this weight class. I never got it. It's always like, well, you got to challenge yourself. Well, you challenge yourself to what? Do you get hurt? Do you get you know your marbles get loose? I mean, come on. Well, it's, it's so weird because cool. in boxing, for the most part, is move up. I remember in MMA when guys went on like a, a a one or two loss streak. It's like, oh, I'm gonna move down. I'm like, dude, you're bat- you're fighting at 145, and you know they go down to 35, and they look terrible on the scale. So mm-hmm. if I'm Pereira, I'll stay at 205, man. I I don't know how many challenges are left there because I'm not even really head over heels for the Jamal um, uh, Hill rematch. But I, I don't get it. that. I don't get that. I think that was clear cut. I, I thought in the locker room he he won because I saw Jamal Hill looking to get an autograph from him and everything yeah. else. I'm like, man, that isn't a good sign. GZ, I'm going to tell you, man, this this is what social media does. I think Jamal has actually talked himself into a rematch. And if not, he's very close to talking himself into a rematch because he's, you know, oh, he looked at the ref and waved the ref off and I relaxed and he hit it. Like, you could say anything now. So I'm not that interested. I don't know how many more challenge out, challenges out there for him in 205. But, man, heavyweight is – it you. You're not guaranteed to get a 235 pound heavyweight. You might get 260 right off the bat. I just don't know if he can deal with the wrestling. Even someone in as a Curtis Blades, a Derek Lewis, even in that realm, is big problems for Pereira. I, I think big even problems. That- and he's tall for a 205er, but you got six five, six six heavyweights that's going to outweigh him. I don't know. That that's a lot of advantages he would give up that I think he benefits from a 205. Okay, well, let's let's change gears a little bit to boxing. Boxing last weekend, Teofimo Lopez, the one-time guy that I was on the bandwagon for as the elite of the elite with his skills, his character, his superstar status. Boy, is he falling off. I don't know what's going on with him. I have my own opinions. I'd like to ask yours. This is two in a row that looked really bad. St- look, Steve Cl- Claggett is a tough guy. But that was a setup fight for him to knock him out. And he has not had a knockout in a little bit. This, that fight there kind of got me to, uh oh, we could be seeing the, on the down end of maybe because of COVID or in the fight he had with Cambosis or what have you. And the, the wars he's been in, he's been in wars. The other thing I saw to that in, like, he got touched up. He had black eyes, swollen. And the way he was talking after the fight, as if this was the great, he's back. And it, no, it wasn't. This is not good. I don't know what your opinion is on this, but this this scares me as to someone who's, whose star is starting to fade quickly. I think we share a brain. I, I was very, very high on Tia Fima Lopez. Tia Fima Lopez years ago fought in New Orleans on the undercard of a Regis Pro Grade card. And I was thinking, this kid is amazing. Like, even going to the gym and watching him train, I'm probably going to take a ton of flack for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway because I really don't care about taking flack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Teofimo Lopez, and I'm not saying from an accomplishment standpoint of anything like that. I'm just saying from what I see with my eyes, reminds me a little bit of Adrian Broner. And I oh, say shit, that yeah. because just a few weeks ago, I said on your show, George, 
Adrian Broner, to me, peaked super early. We saw the best of Adrian Broner when he was probably 24 years old. Sometimes you don't see the best of guys to that 27, 28. Hell, Shakur Stevenson is 27. I still don't know if we've seen his best. So when you get guys where you literally, as high as you was on T.O. when he was 22, 23, as high as I was on him at that age, I think he just peaked. I actually think the the performance against Josh Taylor was more to do with Taylor being very far gone and, and less to do with Teofimo Lopez just blowing him away. Not discrediting the win at all, but I think Taylor was a 135-pound fighter, and we're seeing that. Another reason I compare him to Adrian Broner, because I feel like every Teofimo Lopez fight now, I'm saying what I was saying about Broner a few years ago. It depends on what Teofimo Lopez shows up. That's a problem for a guy that I can normally blame lack of sharp performances on inactivity. Teofimo Lopez just fought Jermaine Ortiz in February. So that was four months ago. I thought he would look spectacular against Steve Claggett. Steve Claggett is a high-pressure guy, um, high-volume guy, but he has seven losses, and he shouldn't have been in the ring. Or uh, Not in the ring. I, I, I apologize for that. Every fighter that gets in belongs there. He shouldn't have been competitive with Teofimo Lopez. And I thought, honestly, he made Teofimo work and earn that victory. And like I said, he got touched up. Um, it didn't look good when I, I saw his face afterwards. I said, this guy was in a rough fight from a guy who, let's say a couple years ago when he was doing the punches behind his back, doing the back flips, he, Steve Laggett wouldn't be in the ring with him. It, yeah. he'd, 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 wash him right, he'd wash him right out the ring. This was a this is a different guy. Now, is the issue the outside stuff similar to an Adrian Broner? Father, wife, mother, total chaos, every camp, every camp. Do, w w now, with that being said, does the father have to step away? Because none of these, none of these father-son trainers, they, they don't work. Uh, Sean Porters did, and one other guy, I forget who else did. I I, I said his name. Those worked. For some reason, they worked. They rarely, um, um, even Mosley and Shane Mosley and his dad, it didn't work. And they were super cool up until then. They went through the amateur. So very rarely do they work. I think T.O. Sr. has taken him as far as he could. He did take him to the Undisputed Championship. But that was on a lot of talent. And Cambosis slipped in there. I think he slipped in there. So um, it was a tough fight. I think he would have lost to... to, to um, Lomachenko before that, but Lomachenko was coming off a shoulder injury, wasn't the greatest performance. Then he fought Cambosis and he slipped in there. Cambosis, he got in there because it was, it was his next fight, and he looked okay. Uh, he lost, but he looked okay. He didn't look bad. This is something where the father had no answers in the corner. I don't think I had none. none. This, there, this is a problem. Do you see this uh, uh, a change coming soon? I don't know if he's willing to make the change, but I think one should be in order. And the reason I say that, because if you look at the fathers, the father son duos that worked, um, Sean Porter, Kenny Porter, that was mm -hmm. more of a business like relationship. The other one to me that seems to work really well is Boots Enos and Boza, his dad. Right. Yes. Because that's more of a business. You don't see them cackling and arguing all the chaos and things that come along with Teofimo Lopez and his father. So, I think one should be in order. I don't know if he would be willing to pull the trigger because, unfortunately, sometimes wins erase um, what we look at as flaws or blemishes. So he won. And you can even hear him say, like, you know, I don't care what people think. I won. I don't care how I look. I won. He's mm -hmm. basing it all on the win now and not the performance. And that's terrible considering the way he used to talk with it being, yeah. you know, the Heisman Trophy. Uh, situation he had going on. It was all about the performance. It was all about the show. Now he's starting to sound like a guy that's saying, like, hey, I won. What else do you want me to do? Um, and he another, also, I'm sorry. Go ahead, G. I was saying, he's almost trying to convince you as the audience to say, I still won. I still won. And that's not... You have to make the statement where you are not questioning if he's won. You're not questioning if he still has it. There's a big difference between elite and someone who's trying to convince you that he's a winner. And an uh, issue I have, uh, a buddy of mine I was talking to said, well, Jermaine Ortiz didn't do nothing but run. So it was hard for him to look good. Okay, I'll give you that. 
Steve Claggan ain't do nothing but fight. <laughs> All dude yeah. wanted to do was come forward and throw punches. And when mm -hmm. Tio in the fourth round threw 100 punches, the most in his career, those were get off of me punches. Those weren't, okay, I'm going to walk you down and get my shots off. Those were punches to get Claggan off of him. I, I, the fact he had to throw 100 punches in the fourth round to get Steve Claggan off, off of him <laughs> just isn't a good look to me. And, and honestly, I, I think Tio's issue is I think he can beat anyone at 140. The problem is I think he can lose to anyone at 140. The tank fight looks weird now. Um, you know, I mean, calling out Bud, I won't even entertain that. But him calling no. out Javante Davis and guys like that is starting to look weird now. Yeah, and then and then I look at that almost even like the Haney situation where you said uh, losses erase things. The fight that Haney had with Lomachenko, his father didn't have answers, and they're like, he's got to get rid of him, he's got to get rid of him, got get rid of him. Then he looks good against Pro Grace, and it's like, oh, you know what? Maybe he's not so bad. And then the Ryan Garcia debacle, one left hook is that's all Ryan Garcia had. He can't stop it. Oh boy, now now there's a little bit of chatter. But I think that I, I like Devin Haney's relationship with his father. I think they handle it well, too. Um, but whether he could take him to the next level, I don't know the background of, you know, Bill Haney uh, in boxing. Here's another, I mean, to piggyback off what you just said. If the issue with the Haney's is basically making Devin walk around with his right hand to the side. Okay. To me, Tio has several things going on. He didn't look good against a guy that stayed away from him. He didn't get look good against a guy that came to him. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the issue is. Like when I watch Tio fight, I see glimpses of that special kid I saw. I just don't see enough of it. And now he's starting to seem like a guy that's fighting down to the level of his opposition a little bit. So his issues to me seem to be a little more multifaceted than you know, him not being able to get out of the way of a shot or just like a defensive liability, it seems very complex. And it starts at home. It starts with his mm -hmm. personal life with, you know, the divorce and the kid. And it, it, it's it's complex, man. Take it in a situation like football. I'm a Jets fan. Zach Wilson, you uh, 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 unbelievable skills, could throw every throw, could do all this. And then he's got the outside crap going. And But even in some of the games, you see, oh, this guy's going to be good. There's glimpses of that great quarterback from college, now that's gone. He's now he's second. I don't even know if he'll make make a team now. Um, and now he's, you know what I mean. There's glimpses still there of this great talent, but the stuff that happened outside, the stuff with his mother, the stuff with his girlfriend, the stuff it's it's total chaos. And they have to have people around them that can control that, or else it's going to be the same situation. And they're blowing it for this kid. They're absolutely blowing it for this kid. And I don't. I I think you're. I I agree with you. I don't know what else is there. I thought this was going to be a spectacular performance because seven losses. Come on, you 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 can't be the elite of the elite. Um, not losing, but you know that guy hanging around there. He can't hang around. Can't. Absolutely not. No, and I didn't like the way – I mean, I, I thought he didn't take any accountability after the Cambosas loss. Oh, they set me up. They kept me at 135 too long. I never liked to see that. So, um, I think – a, a, a little bit's his dad. A little bit's his dad with that nonsense. Lack of his accountability dad. issues within the whole camp. I think lack of accountability within the whole camp. I think they make a lot of excuses. And, I mean, like I say, now he's reserved to saying, basically, I won. He even said, you know, Bob said he's happy, but he don't look too happy. I mean, I, I question some of the fights I want to see him in. I question them now. And I hate that because I love, love what I saw from T.O. early. I, I don't even know if he ever shook back from the Cambosas loss, looking at some of the performances lately. And I've I seen him as an amateur in Florida. I said, man, this kid's going to be, this kid's going to be phenomenal. And I, and I saw him, I remember he was on ESPN. And I felt his career, and I thought this kid is going to be one of these once in a. Uh, you know what? You were so right pinning it just with Adrian Broner. Now that you said that, that is right on target because I couldn't tell you how high I was on Adrian Broner, and then all the nonsense that happened to him. It just it, it man, snowballs. I think, I think we see in guys, man, that just peak super early, and it's disappointing to watch. It's not their fault. It's just disappointing to watch because it's like watching a kid play you know, uh, baseball or, or football or basketball, and you see them in high school and you think the world is their oyster and then they go to the next level and they just don't have it. 
It's not that mm -hmm. they don't work hard or anything. They just literally was as good as they're going to get at 16 years old or 17 years old. I think we saw that with Brown. I think we're seeing a little bit of that with T.O. I think, I mean, he fought Lomachenko in the 16th fight as a pro. Not 21 fights in, we're literally questioning everything about the kid. I just think he peaked super early. It's funny you say that because we had a kid here at the high school, a uh, five-star recruit, number one recruit in the, in the nation, went to Ohio State, which I thought was a mistake. Um, went to Ohio State. I, I, we haven't heard from him, and now he just transferred back to Penn State, where he should have gone in the beginning. His name is Julian wow. Fleming, who was the number one wide receiver, had incredible talents, incredible talent. This kid, and like I said, all of a sudden, it's just you know, whether it's they believe their own hype, I and they, you know, people get on these guys. I don't know if he worked as hard as it was, but everybody's good. Everybody's good. If you're a professional fighter, you are good. Uh, now, you, you know, there are some that are lower level that are there just to, but like Reggie Strickland he had a hundred and something losses. Reggie Strickland can hang with everybody. Reggie was, Strickland was good. Yeah, and a hundred and something losses, I think he got stopped like five times. Like it was something crazy. But I mean, you're absolutely right. Look, I think a lot of these guys' issue is you walk in the room and you're the best player in the room from five years old to 20. Now you're no longer the best player in the room. You're in a room full of good players. You're in a mm -hmm. room full of killers and savages a lot of people don't know how to adjust to that so i always say it, you, it, it's great to be the hammer how do you handle being the nail and i think we're seeing a little bit of that from to to's his swag doesn't even seem the same to me he seems like a guy that wants to put on the show still wants the crazy introduction but when the fight happens it's kind of like i don't know it's like a mental block I, he may benefit from a sports psychiatrist oh yeah it's almost like a uh, a divorce like a divorce, yeah. guys, when they lose their, when, or if a girl breaks up with you, man, guys lose their shit a little bit. They're just like, oh, yeah. oh hey, you don't think you got it anymore than until you get back on that bike. And it might, but uh, the hourglass doesn't get too low for, you know, finding a woman. It's small, small window here in uh, the world of boxing, especially combat sports like boxing. It, it is small. Very small, and Tio Tio's actually benefited from fighting twice in four months because that's rare. So, I mean, maybe we see him before the year end. I'm sure he would love that, considering the way he's looked. But then I, I, I'm so stuck on him because one part of me is like, he looks like he needs a major break from the sport. Another part of me is like, how is he ever going to be sharp unless he keeps going? So, I don't know if I want to see him before the end of the year or literally he he take a break from boxing. For, so for someone who's taking a slide in the bo in his boxing career to someone who now is put on the map, uh, Jesse Bam Rodriguez over the weekend, unbelievable. Uh, kind of put on the back burner for a little bit. Uh, that I mean, great fighter, but no one really, at that lighter weight, no one really says much. In a way, is the guy that they always talk about. Mm -hmm. This guy, Bam Rodriguez, over the weekend, stamped his mark on, hey, I'm here and I'm going to make some noise. What was your opinion and overall uh, look at his performance and what his career is going to end up at? First off, that fight started way too late. They, they are stretching my limits as a 43-year-old <laughs> boxing fan. Staying up with the main event, not kicking off to 12. I don't know how you East Coast guys do it, man. But um, I tell you what, it was worth staying up for. Um, Bam and Gallo Estrada went for it. Um, multiple knockdowns. Bam went down, yeah. I think, the, the, the seventh or the, the sixth. And, mm -hmm. and Gallo goes down in the fourth and finished in the seventh. High pace, high action. It was – I expected Bam to win, and I expect him to win big. I didn't like Gallo's um, long layoff. I, I, the wars with Chocolatito, but, wow, what a perfectly timed body shot. I think the time yeah. was better than actual power behind it. And, um, hey, man, Bam Rodriguez is showing that he's a 24-year-old kid that can punch with both hands. He's going to be hell in them lower divisions, man. If he can stay away from the wars, he can extend his career. They, the, the lower weights tend to get into more wars because they're not knockout punchers. That They're big punchers. So the wars could catch up with someone like him. But uh, one quick point on that fight. Do you see the judging scorecard? <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I, I was going to try not to bring that up. Goodness gracious, man. I mean... I hate the notion of like, well, I'm glad he stopped him because it didn't go to the scorecards. Or if somehow Bam would have won and said, well, at least the right guy won. No, we got to get to the bottom of what fight are these judges watching and who's sitting down with them? They really need to be 
there needs to be some kind of investigation or um, some type of system in place where I say, okay, George, your scorecard is this. Everyone's questioning it. Let's sit down. And I want to see you score it in front of me. And this, it can be a commission member, uh, whatever. But unbelievable, man. That kid was going to get taken to the to the wood shop if he hadn't stopped him. I guarantee you. Yeah, and you know what's you can never question them, but that's like almost like the political system. Once you try, just be transparent. If you're transparent, although people might not like it, that's when the question marks come up. So yes. if you're now, you can't talk to the judges, you can't question them, you can't see who their ties are with. That automatically raises well, this conspiracies. This could happen. This could happen. Well, was this guy at a dinner with this guy last night? There is no way. Strata was that that was a beat down. I mean, it was easier. And again, he had a lot of wars. I'm not taking anything away from him as a fighter. But Bam Rodriguez was head and shoulders above that. I don't think anybody thought he, he was losing, gonna lose that fight. He could have lost that fight or at least got a draw. And that's that's the craziest thing. It wasn't even close, in my opinion. Outside of the round he got knocked down in, you would be hard pressed to find a round to give to Estrada. And I like Estrada. Estrada's a durable guy, tough guy. Um, a ton of longevity in the sport. He did not deserve to even be remotely close on the scorecards. And, I mean, you know, it, you see guys get interviewed after they get knocked out and after controversial decisions. Why the judges can't get interviewed after controversial? They just bail them away from the ringside table and they go on about their business. And I think the problem with judges is most people, even diehard fight fans, rarely know what these guys look like. Like you can literally be sitting in a restaurant with them and wouldn't even be able to pick them out because they're just kind of, they keep them under the radar. They keep them off the, the, the set and they just go on and get the next assignment, man. It's, it's unbelievable to me that they was going to railroad that kid. Well, you would know Adelaide Bird because she gave <laughs> she gave Canelo the fight against Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> That's yeah. the one that you would know. That's nope, about that it. Was, that was actually C.J. Ross. C.J. Ross. Oh, C. sorry, Ross. Adelaide. Sorry, Adelaide. I did not mean that, but because uh, uh, why I thought it was her, I don't C. know. C.J. Ross. Probably resigned after that, by the way. I, like, I haven't heard her since. I have not resigned, heard from her. She resigned oh, she uh, shortly after that. I mean, how can you have that fight? I think she had a draw. Like, come on, man. Yeah. Canelo Strainer was like, no, that's not true. Even Canelo Strainer was like, anyone else? So he said, no, no, we did. and he he said we didn't win that fight. He's like, so I give give Eddie credit. He was like, whoever, who was that? So again, and here's the bad thing, G. If I line up ten diehard boxing friends of mine, they couldn't pick C.J. Ross out of a three person lineup. Like no, we gotta put these people in front of cameras. They should be a, they should be interviewed just like fighters should be. Hell, they interviewed Mike Tyson after he bit Evan the Holyfield. They all. You tell me you can't interview a judge for a bad scorecard? Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like getting an umpire. For, it makes a bad call. It's like, uh, you know, they, they kind of protect them. But the, the umpires, are, again, different standards for, for Major League Baseball, NFL, and <clears throat> the world of boxing, which is the wild, wild west till this day. It, it, boxing solely depends on those three judges if it just so happened to go to the scorecard. So. I got to be the guy to say it because I just say I hate saying it, but I'm so glad he stopped him. I'm so glad he yeah. ended it emphatically because it would have went from knockout of the year and possibly a few rounds of fight of the year to controversy of the year. And what sport needs less controversy than boxing? We can't handle anymore. Uh, we we will be around for a long time because it just keeps popping up. It keeps, it keeps popping getting better, up. Baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, also coming up in the future, in the weekend, Shakur Stevenson returns to New Newark. I think he's coming to New Jersey. I think he's, yes. he's back here again. He is fighting, yeah, which is right by my hometown. Um, Twenty-one and zero. Um, good fight. He's fighting a good fighter. I'm not saying, but I would like to see him fight one of the top echelon guys. Um, is this again a step like Tank? I thought was taking a step sideways. Is Shakur taking a step sideways, or is this just a get me out of my contract? Now let me go with Golden Boy, or let me go with PBC, or let me go with uh, the Zone. What do you think here? What What are you looking at? Um, Based on the fact that the, the Edwin De Los Santos fight didn't look great at all for him, and I think Edwin De Los Santos is actually a really good fight him, fighter, I don't think Artem's a bad fighter. I think uh, many people thought Artem should have got away with a decision against Frank Martin, who literally just fought Javante Davis. So um, I, I, I would call it a lateral move, I guess, from Edwin De Los mm -hmm. Santos to uh, Artem. I'm not a Harushian. I think I got it right. But um, 
I think Shakur being his free agency fight, it's like a, a NFL player. Hey, man, this is your free agent year. He has to show out. and He has to look spectacular in this fight. Having guys boo him, having guys get up and leave the uh, ring, uh, the, the stands for his last fight against De Los Santos, he has to completely erase that memory from our memory bank. And uh, what better platform to do it than in your free agency fight? You're literally going to explore free agency after this fight. You, you got to look spectacular to me. And he's saying all the right things. I hope it translates for him. Now, T.O. said the same thing before his last fight. If Shakur looks bad, too, that's two in a row. You get the same concern as you do with T.O.? <sighs> that's a great question. I would say not the same concern because I don't worry so much about Shakur outside the ring. I think, so, I think with the exception of a little bit of immaturity showing up in Shakur and some of his tweets and some of the some of the interviews he does. I don't have a whole lot of concern about Shakur outside the ring. His grandfather's his trainer, seems to stay in close contact with him. Um, I think it's accumulation for Tio. So I probably would still say a little more concern for Tio. I don't think if Shakur looks mediocre and not that great, we're going to call for a new trainer. A lot more commotion and concern for uh, Tio than Shakur. However, I think he's going to get majorly lowball if he looks subpar when he hits the free agent market. And that's what he's trying to avoid. I think in a financial aspect, I think Bob Aaron wants him to leave like he did Bud Crawford. The problem with Bud Crawford leaving is because Bud didn't draw much. He wasn't a big seller. Okay. Shakur is similar in that way. The only thing is now we're in a different market. Uh, economically, things are unstable right now, honestly. You can't have the heavyweight title fight with Fury and Usyk. They said they lost $20 million. You, yeah. you know what I mean? So economic, and that's from the Saudis. They, they have all the money in the world. So economically, I don't know unless he knocks them out cold, which I don't see happening. I think you're right. He's going to get low ball, and I think he's got to take it. Because I don't know how many more of these things go. You can't keep telling me you're going to fight a tank. You're going to fight a, a guard. Or, well, he's not going to fight Garcia, but a tank, a Haney, a this guy, that guy, and I'm the best, a pit bull. And the fights aren't being made unless you go with somebody else because Aram is kind of done with him. I think Aram's, I think Aram is exactly in the same position he was with, with Terrence Crawford. He was going to be out of the Terrence Crawford business. I think he's going to be out of the Shakur Stevenson business. I don't even think they're going to even offer him a contract. I think he's got to take what he – and I think the offer they offered him before – before he said he was going to free agency, was a decent offer. I think it was four mil. But I don't know if he's going to get that kind of money. I think it's a different ball game now. Things are changing pretty drastically in boxing, financially, finances-wise, because they're looking at that Saudi money. A little different. Yeah, and you can have the way Aram's talking. Hey, I want the kid to go explore free agency, and if things don't go well, maybe he can come back. That sounds to me like if you come back, it's going to be for a lot less than what the initial <laughs> offer was. Um, I do think if it's not a blazing performance, because I'm with you. I don't know if Shakur can stop this kid. But if it's not a blazing 11-1, 12-0 dominant performance where he's keeping the fans engaged, not even that he has to show crazy power or anything. You don't get that overnight. So I'm not expecting – Shakur to go look like Ernie Shavens. But if you can keep the fans engaged for 12 rounds and, and just not have people walk out and boo and things of that nature, I think it helps him. Does it put him where he wants to be and at the pinnacle of the paydays? Probably not because he's just not, like you said, he's not that draw like that. I think Bud Crawford had to have the arrow performance to even garner some of the respect he deserved. Shakur is going to have to do the same thing. He's going to have to fight a tank and blank him or, or beat him. Or, or I mean, I, I wouldn't say a Ryan, like I said, maybe a Devin or somebody like that. He's going to have to have that type of opponent, that type of dance partner to get to the next level. But for this fight, he just can't go backwards and he can't give us another Edwin De Los Santos. I'll even give him the fact that he say he had a hand injury. Saturday night is a, it's the, the slate is clean. We'll see. Let me ask you this. Am I missing something? Everybody who that I speak with says Shakur Stevenson beats Tank, you know, eight, eight to nine, eight to four, or, you know, a whitewash. It's easy. 
I don't see that. Am I the? Am I kind of on the? Why are they so high on him, and still not giving Tank the credit? I think he's a better boxer than people think he is. Obviously, he's got the the eraser, but am I missing something here? So I'll say since the four kings or whatever, Devin, Ryan, Tank, Shakur, uh, throw anybody in there who you want to throw in there. I've said from day one, Shakur beats them all. Mm -hmm. I think Shakur understands distance better than any fight I've seen probably since Floyd Mayweather. I think Shakur's uh, always, and sometimes too much, but always defensively responsible. Shakur Stevenson as a pro has probably lost less rounds his entire career than Tank's lost in one fight. And I think Tank keeps getting away with being, at least on my scorecard, I think I had Frank up 5-1 at one point. If you Jeez. think you're going to get in the ninth, 10th, 11th round in the championship rounds and knock out a Shakur Stevenson and knock out a Vasily Lomachenko, I just mm -hmm. don't see it happening. I think you can do it to inexperienced guys like Frank Martin, like Roley, like um, Hector Garcia, who was really a 130-pounder. Um, a faded Leo Santa Cruz. You get in the ninth round, and you maybe down a round or two, or maybe up a point or so, and you land uh, some Hail Mary punch. I think if you get in, even with a 36, 37 year old Lomachenko, with a 27 year old Shakur Stevenson, if you get down on those cards like Tank has gotten so used to doing, and you're dependent on the knockout in the championship rounds, good luck. And I think he's starting to play that game a lot. Tank loses a lot of rounds, man, because. Even though he was bringing mental pressure to Frank Martin, he wasn't really throwing a whole lot of punches. Um, he just literally mentally walked down Frank Martin, and he wilted. I don't see Shakur doing that, and I'm not even sure an older version of Lomachenko wilts like that. So you, who would you favor, Tank and Lomachenko? I would probably favor Tank just off youth right now, but okay. I don't think that's an easy fight at all for Tank. Even though well, I think somewhat weighted him out, I just think Tank is, he, he throws so few, he landed three punches in the first round of the Frank Martin fight, four punches in the second round. I just think he, he plays that waiting game so well because he knows he has the ultimate equalizer. But mm -hmm. what happens when, and I think that's what we're going to see in these next few fights with Tank. Either a guy gets up, a la Fury Wilder, or you just can't put guys down. You can't chase a knockout late in a fight where you didn't let your hands go. And it's there for the taking. Frank Martin was scared to death of Javante Davis. Yeah. He wasn't <laughs> throwing a ton of punches. He was just kind of waiting on the right punch. I think you play that game with Shakur, man. That's a dangerous game for a kid that can literally do what Frank Martin did for eight rounds in autopilot. Percy, this is why I like talking to you. I mean, I was convinced – I was convinced that Tank would walk him out. But you bring receipts. I talk to you, you bring receipts. You say, this is why, this is why, and this is why. You just don't blank. They say, Shakur's just a better boxer. You tell me about the distance. You talk about his footwork. Talk, so it's why I enjoy talking to you. And we teased it at the beginning of the show. You got something coming up down the pipe. And um, I told, uh, you told me that you wanted to make an announcement here on my show here. And I was like, okay, let's do it. What, what do you got coming out of the, the pipe here that's going to surprise people? So the VIP crew was something I want to announce on here. It just kind of came together a little quicker than we wanted it to. So that's happening. But um, former Indiana Pacer and New York Nick, uh, Jonathan Bender, for anybody that doesn't know him, um, straight from Picky on High School to the NBA in 1999. He was the fifth pick in the draft by the Indiana Pacers. Um, knee injuries destroyed his career. Um, I'm going to be doing some work with Bender. I'm actually uh, – getting some things lined up for him now. He'll be doing some speaking engagements, some basketball camps, some seminars. Um, he's a guy that took what shortened his career and and actually made an invention called um, J-Bit Med Pro. And it's this contraption for people with knee pain. So anybody want to look up J-Bit, uh, J-B-I-T, Med Pro, M-E-D-P-R-O, look that up. It's an amazing invention. He's a amazing entrepreneur he's li he's literally took his downfalls and and he's helping others so they don't suffer the same fate he has but great speaker great entrepreneurial mind and uh i'll be doing a lot of work with uh bender we even had that doing 
maybe a podcast or, or some type of show to um, just talk about entrepreneurship, talk about injuries, knee pain, things of that nature. So very excited to be working with him. Uh, very good dude, man. We give each other a hard time, but we have a ton of respect for each other. And he's a big I I know Jonathan. I I I was a Nick fan, and uh, I remember when they picked him uh, right out of high school. That that was when they were all picking out of high school. That was at that before they cut that short. Yes. But uh, John the Bender, I remember. Um, he did disappoint a little bit with the Knicks. Obviously, the injuries and stuff that 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 happens at, at that at that level when you're that big and don't. And again, back in the day, they didn't have all the nutrition stuff and the workout stuff that didn't happen. Um, but. Still, I always liked him. I thought he was a good, good, good athlete, great player um, in high school. I followed his career. Get picked by the Knicks was, uh, you know, you can't, you're not bad if you're getting picked by the Knicks right out of college, uh, right out of high school, uh, fifth pick. Um, but be, turning that into a positive. Now, my um, uh, there's a pot of brand is expanding a little bit more into like a media company where obviously I'll do the boxing and MMA combat. My brother does all the WWE wrestlers and old school wrestlers and the bodybuilders. And we're expanding more into entrepreneurship and stuff like that. And that, so Jonathan would be actually a perfect guest for me as we go through the next, obviously I have my business. I'd love to get him on to the show too. Uh, when we when we start, we're launching that probably in September. It's just been okay. I'm building I'm building a deck, and uh, I am no Bob Vila. It is a nightmare. So I mean, I'm kind of my whole summer has been taken up by this. So we haven't even enjoyed <laughs> it yet. It's not not good, not good. And uh, your wife holding my wife holding the screws doesn't help much either. Because uh, <laughs> we understand. Look, you get into them projects, man. It'll chew your summer to pieces, but. Look, anytime you want him on, man, you know you know how I feel about you and your platform. So anytime you want him on, we can make that happen for sure. Well, we're definitely going to do some stuff. Percy Crawford, the VIP crew, always follow. Again, like and subscribe to his channel, the VIP crew on YouTube. He's there with Vivek Wallace. They have some great content just starting up right now. It's soft opening, as he said, but sooner or later it's going to be rocking and rolling. We're going to have you on and probably Vivek on if he can. I, I don't know his schedule. We can get him Absolutely. on too. We'll get them all on. We'll get it going there's a pot of brand podcast is always, always an honor to have Percy Crawford from the VIP crew joining us. Percy, thanks for coming on, buddy. Thanks for having me, man. Happy 4th of July, man. I hope you guys enjoy, bro. And uh, good luck with that deck, man. Yeah, hopefully 4th of July. Keep your fingers. No fireworks, guys. Keep, no, keep fireworks. Those fingers there. no fireworks. No fireworks. No, let it leave notes up to the pros. That's right. Thanks, Purse. Thanks for having me, bro. Thanks for watching the Sapata brand podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast and listen where all podcasts are available.